everybody. Thanks for joining me early, early on a Thursday. Um, this is a breaking news situation that I thought would be best served as a live stream. So as everybody gathers here, let me uh, start by giving an update on yesterday's episode about the four internet cables that were cut at the bottom of the Red Sea. So indications I've received subsequent to that episode going live, and this is from a very credible, actually an, an industry inside insider source, is that all indications are that those internet cables were cut by the merchant vessel Ruby Mar sinking and hitting the seafloor of the of the Red Sea, which some folks had surmised. And in fact, I spoke to it during the episode. Now, this isn't for sure, but indications among the industry that lays internet cable on seafloors are that this cable, those cables were cut by the MV Ruby Mars. So, you know, you can kind of do the math though. And I tweeted this earlier this morning. So Houthis launch anti-ship missiles at the Ruby Mar, damage, damaging it significantly. And uh, Ruby Mar is down at the stern for days, drifting, you know, crew abandoned ship, uh, some um, Operation Prosperity Guardian assets mitigate the, the fire, but the ship is adrift, dragging anchor around the Red Sea for days and finally ultimately sinks and it goes down to the bottom. So this is kind of like a legal analog. So if I am a juvenile delinquent that fires a gun at the tire of an automobile as it's passing by on the highway, and that automobile goes out of control and winds up causing a humongous crash, multi-car crash that results in loss of life, for instance. Am I, as the person who pulled the trigger, guilty of murder? Certainly I'm culpable for what happened. So that's kind of the way to look at this with respect to the the Houthis' responsibility for ultimately what wound up being a major global internet disruption, as we described. If you haven't seen that episode, check it out. There's there's things to see beyond just that Red Sea event in terms of how dependent we are on these cables that run along sea floors. Because I think a lot of us think about Wi-Fi and trons through space that get us our connectivity, but 99% of internet happens through these cables that run under the sea. All right, so let's talk about the V-22 grounding and ungrounding. So let's go back. On December 6th of last year, Navair tweeted this, and I'll explain what Navair is in a second. Out of an abundance of caution following the AFSOC, and that's the Air Force Special Operations Command, operational stand-down, NAVAIR, which is the Naval Air Systems Command, is instituting a grounding bulletin for all V-22 Osprey variants December 6th. This decision comes after the V-22 Osprey mishap on November 29th off the shore of Yakashima in Japan. And that was a CV-22 variant. And we'll go through the different models of V-22s here in a second as well. Subsequent tweets to that one on December 6th were preliminary investigation information indicates a potential material failure caused the mishap, but the underlying cause of the failure is unknown at this time. While the mishap remains under investigation, we are implementing additional risk mitigation controls to ensure the safety of our service members. And this is what DOD particularly is good at are these sort of buzzwords and this, you know, unclear language, imprecise language. 
The Joint Program Office, the JPO, which is located at NAVAIR, and joint in this case means three services, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, and also the industry partners of the V-22, which is Bell and Boeing, are co-located with the military side of the house on the acquisitions and procurement side at NAVAIR. And this was a function of the V-22's program getting stopped in 2000 and then returned to flight in 2002. So the industry execs and subject matter experts and engineers and everything else are right there in the office with the military guys. The safety, okay, so JPO continues to communicate and collaborate with V-22 stakeholders and customers, including allied partners. And as always, this is this boilerplate, the safety of pilots and air crews is our number one priority. For more information, please contact NAVAIR at NAVAIRPAO at us.navy.mil. And if you do that, you won't hear anything. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. So the stakeholders, and as a reminder, I worked V-22 at NAVAIR for three years from 2002 to 2005. And I'll, I'll talk about, and that's also um, full um, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, full disclosure that I, I have skin in this game and am and, and proud of my work and the work I did with the team at that time to get the V-22 fielded in the first place. And we'll go through the details of that during this live stream. And I'll get to your questions and comments uh, once I tee this up as normal. Remember, it's just me. Mrs. Mooch is not here. So unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm doing all the moving parts here at the same time. So stakeholders, three different services, as I mentioned. There's the Air Force, and that means Air Force Special Operations Command that flies the CV-22, which is a tricked out V-22. It has all kinds of Gucci gear to go through SAM envelopes and to jam and to uh, dodge heat-seeking missiles. Very cool airplane that special operators used extensively during the post 11 wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and have used extensively in the counter ISIS and other sort of contingency operations that we've done in recent years. So Air Force is the first customer flying the, the CV-22. Then <clears throat> the reason the airplane was basically fielded is the MV-22 used by the Marine Corps. And then finally, most recently, the Navy has just introduced the CMV-22 as the new carrier onboard delivery aircraft, which is replacing the venerable C-2 Greyhound. We'll go into the details of that as well. So the program of record, the buy, was 50 CV-22s, 360 MV-22s, and I'm not sure, to be honest, how many CMV-22s the Navy is buying. Probably between 25 and 50 would be my guess. All right, so that was what happened on December 6th. So since that time, the airplane has been grounded. And I've had my ear to the tracks. There were some whispers that it was going to get ungrounded some weeks ago, but it didn't happen till literally just over two hours ago, the airplane was ungrounded. And so let's take a look at the NAVAIR statement. The title is NAVAIR Returns V-22 Osprey to Flight Status, effective March 8th, 2024 at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Naval Air Systems Command is issuing a flight clearance for the V-22 Osprey, thereby lifting the grounding. This decision follows a meticulous and data-driven approach, prioritizing the safety of our air crews. The U.S. Air Force investigation began following the tragic loss of eight airmen during the November 29, 2023 mishap, 
mishap off of Yakushima, Japan. Thoughts and prayers are with the families of the fallen. In response to the preliminary investigation indicating material failure of a V-22 component, the V-22 grounding was initiated on December 6, 2023. The grounding provided time for a thorough review of the mishap and formulation of risk mitigation controls to assist with safety returning the V-22 to flight operations. In concert with the ongoing investigation, NAVAIR has diligently worked with the Air Force-led investigation to identify the material failure that led to the mishap. Close coordination among key senior leaders across the U.S. Navy, U.S. Marine Corps, and U.S. Air Force has been paramount in formulating the comprehensive review and, refer- and return to flight plan, and this collaboration will continue. Maintenance and procedural changes have been implemented to address the material failure that allow for a safe return to flight. Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force will each, each execute their return to flight plans according to the service-specific guidelines. So stand by, because that's all we know in terms of detail. So the investigation that identified the material failure, we don't know what that is specifically. And so it's somewhat ironic that the next paragraph s- states, NAVAIR remains committed to transparency and safety regarding all V-22 operations. I believe they're committed to safety. They're absolutely not committed to transparency. The V-22 plays an integral role in supporting our nation's defense and returning these vital assets to flight is critical to supporting our nation's interests. NAVAIR continuously monitors data and trends from all aircraft platforms so service members are provided the safest, most reliable aircraft possible. The safety of our pilots, air crew, and surrounding communities remains of paramount importance. So let's do some background. The Naval Air Systems Command is located in Southern Maryland, Lexington Park, aboard Patuxet River Naval Air Station. And Pax River is where the test pilot school is. It's where all the Navy's operational test squadrons are, I'm sorry, developmental test squadrons are. Um, So VX-23, the V-22 Developmental Test Program is located there. Um, All of the rotary wing test programs, it's a very important facility and and NAVAIR is a very important command. The current commander of NAVAIR is a guy I've known for a long time. Vice Admiral Carl Chebby. So Chebs was a Tomcat guy. In fact, he served in the sister squadron. He was in VF-142, the Ghost Riders. When I was in VF-143, the Puking Dogs, aboard the Eisenhower back in 91-92 time frame when I was, it was my second tour, his, his Nugget tour. Great guy. And any guy who was able to successfully fly the Tomcat on and off the boat for years and years, especially that was a cruise where we did the North Atlantic ops that were really hairy. And I've described that at length. So Chebs is the real deal is the bottom line. Further, he has skin in this game because his son is currently in the V-22 pipeline. And I'm not sure where exactly in the pipeline he is, is, but this isn't an abstract to Admiral Chebby. So, Admiral Chebby went to Japan late last week to brief the Japanese, who also are stakeholders and fly the V-22, on what the return to flight process was looking like across the various services. And I'm sure he briefed them in great detail on what the investigation had identified in terms of material failure and what those maintenance and procedural changes that were implemented are. So that was a dependency before the return to flight, the ungrounding was gonna happen. Now let's go way back and talk about the history of the V-22. The V-22 was originally fielded to replace the another venerable aircraft that I've actually flown the H-46 and ridden in it a bunch over the years. The H-46 Sea Knight, 
lovingly known as the frog. So the Sea Knight was for decades the Marine Corps' medium lift assault support aircraft. So the V-22 was fielded to replace that airplane, not the H-53 or any other airplane in the Marine Corps inventory. And not unlike the Harrier, the Marine Corps fell in love with the, the idea of this technology, which is it can go from helicopter mode to airplane mode. The nacelles, where the engines go, tilt. It's a tilt rotor. It's not a helicopter. It's a tilt rotor aircraft. Also, because of that speed advantage, it's twice as fast as the H-46. It can go twice as far. So you see this diagram showing the contrast between the H-46 combat radius and the V-22 combat radius. Now, during the course of the first iteration of developmental test into operational test, the Marine Corps particularly got ahead of itself, let's just say. Operational test, which was being conducted by VMMT-203, which is also the RAG, but they were doing operational tests and they were trying to get the airplane to op out as well before it was going to be approved for full rate production. But the Marines were very much in liking this airplane and the pilots flying it were learning on the fly what the airplane's performance capabilities were and they, they got ahead of developmental test. And as a function of that, they were regularly going into what's called vortex ring state, which is basically deep stall of the prop rotors. And in, in the case of one mission they were flying over Marana, Arizona, the lead airplane crashed, killing all the aircrew and the Marines who were aboard. They were doing an exercise at, out there at, at Marine Air Weapons Training School. And the trail airplane was also strike damage, but the pilot, who I know, was able to recognize that the airplane's sink rate was too high, and he converted the nacelles to forward and was able to arrest the rate of descent just to, in, in, enough to save people's lives, which is a great call. Now, that mishap by itself didn't stop the program. However, a few months later, another V-22 was flying approaches into Marine Corps Station New River, which is near Camp Lejeune, south of Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. And the pilot got a warning light. He misunderstood the relationship of that light and the rotor pitch, the prop rotor pitch. So what was happening is every time he tried to push that light out to clear that fault, the prop rotor pitch went to zero. And he just repeatedly kept trying to put the light out each time the airplane descended until it finally hit the swamp short of the runway. Four Marines were killed in that mishap. As a function of that, the V-22 program wasn't canceled. It was halted, stopped. So a major reorg took place and the Marine Corps was able to effectively leverage the industry base lawmakers to make sure the airplane didn't get canceled because they very much believed in it. Further, their H-46s were getting super old, long in the tooth, and this was the only airplane the Marine Corps had in the pipeline. So it had to work. And this has been the case with some other programs and some that are currently being fielded. So as I mentioned, they created a joint program office, Bell Boeing, two primes, not just one, two primes, worked out of the office there at Pax River along with all of the competency leads, engineering, weapon system integration, contracts. There were folks from Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. So this was my first job after I retired from the Navy. I worked at V-22. 
And I had no procurement experience. I had never been a uh, engineering duty officer. I'd only landed at Pax River once in a Tomcat doing ACLS work. Um, it was kind of f interesting. It taught me what it was to be a Rio because my pilot, who was the squadron XO at the time, got out and a guy I'd never met jumped in and came up the intercom and said, hey, I'm Pounder. You ready to go? And we flew around the pattern as he did the automatic carrier landing system testing. And so I'd never even met the guy. It's like jumping on the back of somebody, somebody's motorcycle and driving around. But, you know, the assumption is if a guy knows how to start the airplane up in taxi, uh, you know, plus he got in at VX 23. So I later met him and we joked about it. But in any case, that's the only time I'd ever operated in and out of Pax River. So now I'm working at the V 22 as the communications guy. Now, I didn't know anything about communications either. I wasn't a public affairs officer in the Navy, but they took the fact that I had two novels out at the time and 2,800 hours in tactical jets and jammed those together and said, you could probably work as a public affairs officer at Nav Air. And so eventually I got to V-22. They needed somebody who's very aggressive. Colonel Dan Schultz was the program manager at the time, a Marine Corps H-53 driver who later was CEO of Sikorsky, a great guy. So he and I were simpatico. And uh, we got the message on the streets that the V-22 was, in fact, fixing what was wrong. And that was specifically the things that had gotten it grounded in the first place, which was a misunderstanding of high-rated ascent. Now, the other principal, later, um, the Deputy Commandant of the Marine Corps, Greg Walters Bluto, was the CEO of a special squadron that they stood up called VMX-22 at New River. This was an all-star team, and Bluto was a fantastic aviator, a great leader, and a guy who understood how to make this work. So along with the program office and Colonel Schultz and Colonel Schultz's relief, Colonel Olson, who was an Air Force officer, they created the Oppaval program that got the airplane fielded. And I was there. I spent a lot of time at New River and worked with those guys very closely. Um, some of the alums of that squadron are still in the Marine Corps as general officers. And so the airplane was used a lot in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in fact, this picture was taken in Afghanistan at Bagram down in southern Afghanistan. I was able to fly during my embed there where we went all around the country, Paktika province, Kabul, interviewed General McChrystal, two weeks before he got fired for that Rolling Stone article, went down to Kandahar and then south of Kandahar is Bastion, which is where Camp Leatherneck was, and flew with VMM-263 all around Helmand province. The airplane was being used as we messaged it would be. Take off, launch up to 10,000 feet, convert 250 knots wherever you go, convert back to helicopter mode, rapid descent into unfinished landing areas, and different fobs and outposts. I was actually pretty proud of how, how they were using it. So, again, Marines using it a lot. And years go by. Finally, as mentioned in the Navair tweets, the CV-22 crashes off of Japan, killing eight and the airplane is grounded. So let's talk about the engineering. Again, what they're saying here, well, I'll tell you what, let, let, me, let me do this. I, I wanna, before we talk about specifics, let me read the article that Sam Legrone just published because it's another good sort of scene setter. And USNI News, as regular viewers of the channel know, is my go-to with a lot of this stuff. Uh, this is the Naval Institute's news arm. And again, full disclosure, I worked at the Na Naval Institute for five years, and that's the job I quit to become a full-time YouTuber. Um, also, Naval Institute Press is the publisher of, my, of the Punks trilogy and was the original publisher of Punks War back in 01. Been a member for years, decades, but in any case, they are the 
outlet of record for these sorts of things. So let's let's take a look at Sam's article here. So Sam writes, after more than three months of probing the fatal V-22 Osprey crash that killed eight airmen off the coast of Japan, investigators say they know what failed aboard the Air Force tilt rotor, but they still don't know why. And you'll see how some people are pushing back on that logic. You know, it's, it's frustrating and, and unsatisfying. Officials from the JPO wouldn't specify the component that failed on November 29th. And here's a quote from Colonel Brian Taylor at the uh, JPO, the V-22 Joint Program Office. He's the program manager currently, and I don't know him. Quote, I can't talk about what the exact component is, but what I will tell you is we have very high confidence that we understand what the what component failed and how it failed. What we are still working on is the why. And so it's still in the hands of the investigation. Okay, so we know what failed. We don't, we don't know why it failed. But we're returning to flight. Okay, so that that's not watertight, just to be cryptic about it. The Air Force Special Operations Command CV-22 that crashed during a training mission. Gungdom-22 was submerged for almost a month while Navy and Air Force worked to recover it. The corrosion the aircraft suffered hindered the investigations. They were trying to understand why the component failed. Colonel Taylor said, the mishap is actually still under investigation. And there have been two investigations that have been stood up by the Air Force Special Operations Command the Safety Investigation Board, and the Accident Investigation Board, Taylor said. Again, this is complicated. And so if you're confused at this point, you have, you, you're, you're in a good, you're, you're sort of correct to be. But based on the initial data gathered by the Air Force investigation, AFSOC, the Navy and Marine Corps have determined the range of ways the unspecified part can fail and have built in protections for maintenance and flight procedures to prevent the component failure. Quote, the mitigation that we're putting in place really addresses this one particular component and how it operates inside the aircraft. And we'll talk about the range of what that one particular component could be in a second here. The intent of these mitigations is to enable this component to continue to do its job within the overall aircraft, but to do it with a little more of a margin of safety. There's a picture of a CMV-22 coming aboard Nimitz. What NAVAIR would not detail, I'm sorry, while NAVAIR would not detail the failure of the Air Force investigators identified, Marine Corps Assistant Deputy Commandant for Aviation Brigadier General Richard Joyce said it was separate from the hard clutch engagement fault responsible for at least one Marine Corps fatal MV-22 crash. So that's a big deal. That it's not hard clutch engagements is a big deal. So A lot of us were pointing to that as root cause, but what General Joyce is saying here specifically is it's not that. The Marines found that replacing a gearing component before the aircraft reaches 800 hours of service mitigates the issue. But like the fault, the Air Force CV-22, the service doesn't know why. And then there's some sort of background, but this is the part Um, that I want to chat about in terms of what the concerns are. So General Joyce says, when you go from 91 days of no flight ops to suddenly a return to flight, you have to be very, very deliberate. That's a long time to not be flying, especially when you're talking about now, Bataan is headed home. So that ARG isn't doing the intense flight ops they were as they return home, they'll probably do some just proficiency back in the saddle, as we call it, ops, which are fairly mild, you know, so it won't be any rapid conversions in those cells and and, and the kind of under fire flight ops that you would practice. So they can be kind of ginger with it. And Sam goes on to write, for example, it's unclear whether the 15th Mu will take MV-22s aboard Boxer when it deploys later this year, Joyce told reporters. So that's a big deal. You know, an ARG without V-22s is not the capability that the Marine Corps has designed. 
So it says Somerset LPD, part of Boxer Arg, deployed in January, while Boxer and Harper's Ferry are still at the pier in San Diego. So this will be the next Arg, possibly on station in the Med. Again, General Joyce says there's not an answer right now, but they're looking at it. And that's frankly one of the most pressing decisions that has to get made. Just the sort of vague language. For the Navy, it could take several months for its fleet of CMV 22Bs to fully assume the carrier onboard delivery mission. It requires lengthy overwater flights. And this is the new Airbus, Admiral Cheever, under this is call sign, told reporters. Until the CMV 22Bs are cleared for the COD mission, West Coast deployed aircraft carriers are relying on legacy Greyhounds. And so Greyhound squadrons have been stood back up. Orders have been modded for those who thought that they were done flying Greyhounds. And a lot of them were overseas for an extended period. So props to the Greyhound squadrons for picking up the, the slack here. As the Navy and Marine Corps and Air Force return the Ospreys to flight, at least one member of Congress has found the Pentagon's findings insufficient to allow V-22s back in the air. So here's a quote from uh, House Oversight and Accountability Committee Chair James Comer of Kentucky. So Congressman Comer says, DOD is lifting the Osprey grounding order despite not providing the Oversight Committee and the American people answers about the safety of this aircraft. The House Oversight Committee has yet to receive adequate information requested from DOD as part of our ongoing investigation launched month ago, months ago into the safety and performance of the Osprey aircraft. Serious concerns remain, such as accountability measures put in place to prevent crashes, a general lack of transparency. Remember, the NAVAIR release said, NAVAIR re remains committed to transparency. So Congressman Comer said, there's a general lack of transparency in how maintenance and operational upkeep is prioritized and how DOD assesses risk. All right, so that's, that's a lot going on there. All right, so here's a cutaway of the V-22. And that, General Joyce said, it's not the prop rotor gearbox. Eliminate some concerns associated with a asymmetric thrust situation that is, occurs when the, you have a hard clutch engagement that causes the interconnecting drive shaft. And it's hard to see in this diagram, but the interconnecting, interconnecting drive shaft runs between the two engines. It's there in the event that you have an engine failure on one side, the interconnecting drive shaft will keep the prop rotor turning. And therefore you'll have symmetrical thrust instead of asymmetric thr thrust. And here's a poor man's diagram of that interconnecting drive shaft, which it's not a beefy piece of gear. And again, the investigation is ongoing, but if that interconnecting drive shaft fails in the event of an engine failure on either side, you have an asymmetric thrust situation that is irrecoverable. And you can just see the airplane. This is CMV-22. What makes it amazing in terms of its capability, what makes it a generational shift from a normal rotary wing aircraft meaning twice as fast, twice as far, also is a huge liability in terms of the physics. Also, just for the record, the V-22 can technically auto-rotate. It can descend fast enough to get air through the prop rotors to make them spin. However, when you say auto-rotate to a helicopter pilot, what that means is I can arrest my rate of descent in the end game. And this is what they learn at Whiting and Fort Rucker and anywhere else. If you're a commercial helicopter pilot, you learn how to auto-rotate. You know, an H-57, uh, uh, any any of those lightweight helicopters can, can do it and have done it and saved a lot of lives that way. V-22 cannot auto-rotate in that way. There's no way to arrest that rate of descent. And you can only auto-rotate it at altitude. So let's make that clear. So this grounding impacted Bataan's ability to do the mission for sure. You can see all the V-22s parked on the bow there. 
You know, if you can't fly V-22s, you can't execute a non-combatant evacuation operation. And that's why they were in the Eastern Med. You can't do it. Also of interest, yes, the Bataan has Harriers and not F-35Bs. So that's a big, that's a big deal. And again, the West Coast carriers like Vincent, although Vincent's back home now, but Vincent lost its COD capability for an interim period there while they were in Westpac when the V-22 was grounded. Not to mention the AFSOC guys didn't have their CV-22s. So this, this all equals an issue. All right, so let me get to the comments now. Let's have a little chat about So our good friend and patron Himmelganger from Norway is talking to Rain Man. And I guess, Himmelganger, you're explaining why the Navy chose the CMV-22. And you're correct. Um, the and, and there is some criticism that this was some folks putting their finger on the scale of what the choice was going to be instead of the C2B, which is a tested, time-tested, reliable platform that they went with the CMV-22. Because when I was working V-22, what we were calling the HV-22, the Navy variant, was not part of the program of record. And so we were just talking about, this would be a great COD replacement. And nations like Japan should use it because it's an island nation. You can reach these island chains very quickly. It's a great airplane for other countries that have to service remote locations in a hurry. And so the CMV-22 became part of the program of record in recent years. And the key performance parameter, the KPP, that, that drove that is it has to be able to carry the F-135 engine, which is the F-35 engine which the COD can't do. The C2 can't carry it. And some critics, in fact, some who were working in OPNAV requirements at that time, I will not name names, said that was an artificial requirement that drove the decision to V22. And now you deal with these issues. So if you want to be either a realist or a cynic, you can say that the Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force are over leveraged against the V-22. They have no choice but to make it work because there's nothing else in the pipeline. You don't have another medium lift aircraft for the Marine Corps. There's no other special operations AFSOC airplane with this capability that the Air Force has. And the Navy doesn't have, besides the the C-2 Bravo, which could be fielded in a hurry if it had to be. Um, but the, the, the Navy's gone, made the decision, we're, we're using the V-22 as our COD. And once you make the decision, all the infrastructure, infrastructure, logistics, supply chains, training tracks, all of that is, this is long lead stuff. You can't, it's not like just going to an auto showroom and, and turning in the, the car for another one. You know, so Himmelganger is correct here. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with the C2 is a dead end. The C2 isn't a dead end. Uh, the C2 doesn't work because of this requirement that was injected into the KPPs that we have to um, use, or we have to have um, the 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 COD has to be able to carry the uh, the F35 motor. All right, let's see what else we got here. Old Silver, I love statistics. Help me balance a 6,000-mile natural gas pipeline. Statistics are just facts with documentation. Okay. Warhorse 500. Osprey, like so many other military aircraft before it, is still an immature technology. But we need, we need it because the aircraft to replace was old and increasingly unserviceable. Yes. 
As a Tomcat guy, I can relate, right? That's why we got rid of the F-14. Now, immature technology. And as I mentioned during the episode months ago that I, when, the air, when the Osprey was grounded, an engineer said to me, you know, we really should be fielding the airplane after this one, meaning after the V-22, because this is legacy technology. So when you look at what the Valor has in terms of the tilt rotor components, it's a generation beyond what the V-22 has. And so that's why I'm curious and will be hawking if they ever come public with what is this thing that they think it is. Because the other language we hear about is this thing called a quill assembly that came up earlier. We got to replace the quill assembly. And to be honest, I, I don't know what that, what that is. It's an engine component. I don't know if it's associated with uh, the, the, the gearbox or what. So the closest we're getting to an explanation of what the mitigating steps are is replacing a component before 800 hours. And so I'm guessing, this is just Mooch com connecting the dots, that that is the input quill assembly that they're replacing. But again, like Congressman Comer is frustrated, I, I share his frustration. And you heard the lack of the logic in Sam's article there. Even, even as General Joyce was, was speaking, he's like, we know how it fit we know what failed but we don't know why okay um so warhorse says as it is the hue and cry over accident rates feels a bit exaggerated what is the actual number of class a mishaps per 1000 hours so if anybody knows that you could probably google that please put it in chat because that's a great point that warhorse makes um a reasonable one would be less than two um, so let's see, let's see what it is. Okay, just hawking the comments here. Nolan Waddell says they're ungrounded now or they set a date. Yes, they're ungrounded now, as of two hours and 42 minutes ago, which is why I'm doing this live stream. So if you're not a subscriber, become one so you don't miss things like this, right? And that's why I want to do this as a live stream. James Lockheed says, the V-22 is defiantly better than Greyhounds, though. I think he means definitely better than Greyhounds, though. Um, we'll see, you know. Um, Greyhound flyers and those who've ridden on greyhounds uh may may argue with that so michael dewey says having worked the v22 program for 10 years from fsd to emd and lrip that's low rate initial production the v22 is everything the marines wanted and more the material failure is supposedly a transmission clutch anomaly that can be fixed roger that michael i like that idea Right. So I concur with the idea that perhaps things are exaggerated. I there's been <clears throat> a lot of sentiment in the wake of the grounding, how this airplane's you know inherently dangerous and should have never been fielded and so forth and so on. I, I, I think that's bogus. I agree with Michael. And obviously I'm not unbiased here. I have skin in the game. Um and have ridden in the airplane a bunch, both developmental test and at war and i would do it again in a heartbeat you know if somebody said hey the only way to get out to the aircraft carrier is in a v-22 i'm like let's go right um however at the same time i'm not fully satisfied like you're trying to engender trust with these explanations and if i'm a member of the public i'm, I'm not quite there entirely Dusky 1966 makes a good point. 
C2 couldn't carry the aircraft engines from 20 to 40 years ago. Think TF-30s and F-110s. You had engines pre-positioned on the CVNs and supply ships. That's a brilliant point. And that's kind of what my guy in OpNav was saying. So if you make this a dependency for the choice of the COD replacement, you're leaving out history. And suddenly this becomes the driver in a way that is unprecedented. And perhaps a critic could say it was artificial. So that's a good point, Dusky. Thanks for bringing that up. Himmelganger is responding to my um, criticism, criticism of his statement. Uh, C2's dead end is hyperbole, imperative with only 180 characters to play with. You know how I'm verbose I can be. Yeah, you know, we love you. Himmelganger, again, he's in Norway. He's a regular attending to our patron happy hours on Friday. This is why if you want to be a, a patron, as I pitch at the end of some episodes, uh, you have access to our Friday happy hours. In fact, this Friday, this afternoon at five o'clock, we're going to do it. Rainman says, so here's another issue. From what I understand, the 22 needs refueling due to its range limits. So how are they going to do that? Navy C-130s? No, they, the, the V-22 can go 275 knots in airplane mode. So it can tank off of any asset that DOD has. Um, Half or more are down because they're so old. All right, so that's another thing. So because it took so long to field the V-22, just, and this isn't unlike uh, F-35s, right? The, the, we're talking 25 years, DT, OT, OPAVAL, full rate production, um, IOC, initial operational capability. That's the same time frame it took for the V-22. As I mentioned in the previous grounding, V-22 grounding episode, the irony of fielding a new airplane and the full rate production, the Milestone 3 decision came in 2002. And this is an airplane that originally flew in like 1984. Um, so in 2002, full rate production, IOC, passes Abavel, boom. Now, now the airplane's in the fleet and a very deliberate and meticulous replacement, one squadron at a time. Give us your H-46s. They're going to Davis Mothin and the, the Boneyard. And here now you have these V-22s. Well, their supply chain and parts faced obsolescence issues with a brand new airplane because of how long it took. All right. So the airplane now, okay, so 2002 till now is what, 22 years? So yes, you have, this airplane's getting old. We still think of it as kind of a new airplane, but it's getting old. Further, the factory in Amarillo, I understand, has made its last V-22, including the CMV-22s. So I think of that facility as brand new. We went there a bunch, the Big Texan Steakhouse. If you can eat the 72-ouncer, you get it for free. Amarillo is a cool place. You know, it just had that torrential rain and wildfires and stuff going on up there. I hope everybody's uh, all right. Um, but um, that factory is now about to get closed. And so all these Bell Boeing employees are now going to have to go somewhere else potentially. And they probably were thinking, hey, we'll be here for our entire life. Um, so that's strange for me to think of, okay, now that manufacturing run, that production line is done. And so forth and so on. So yes, you're correct. Uh, this is the problem when it takes too long to field an airplane or any any system. And that's what procurement reform is targeting, is making that happen um, faster. So Alan says, I joined late, so excuse me if you've covered this. My understanding of the V-22 is lack of full auto rotation because the smaller rotor size chosen for shipboard storage. Well, it's smaller rotor size chosen for the fact that it's a tilt rotor. And it's not, you know, it has shipboard storage and it, it does this cool like thing when it folds. I should have done animation of what that looks like. Um, it's, it's a very intricate uh, process to have that airplane fold for, for deck storage. 
but that's not the driver. The driver is you need two discs, discs, proper discs, side by side. So obviously they can't hit each other, right? So that's why they're the size they are. And as a function of that disc loading, it, again, can technically, as you talk about the aeromechanics of auto rotation, it can auto rotate. However, not in the way that you think about when you're going through flight school as a helicopter pilot. It can't arrest the rate of descent in the end game to save the airplane. I hope that makes sense. What about the F-35 engine that the C-2 can't carry? Size or weight? It's size. It's cubed. It's cubed out. But again, I love the point about, well, we couldn't carry an F-110. The Tomcat guy, you know, we went through engines out there and they were either unwrapped or they were already aboard, right? And when you pull into port, then you do some, here comes some more engines and components and what whatnot. You know, we have we have the means to take care of this. All right, here's a John Hall. Okay, according, thank you, John, for, for getting on this. Uh, and John's got some quals behind his name there. So thanks for tuning in. Love it when credible guys join the chat. According to the latest data from the Air Force Safety Center, the average Class A mishap rate per 100,000 flight hours was 6.0 for the CB-22 in its lifetime. That's high. Okay, the Tomcat was at one point, like one point something. And as we were losing a bunch due to flat spins in the 1988, 89 timeframe, um, it went up to three something. So six is high. If anybody can find the MV class A rate, that would, that would be great. But thanks for that gouge, John. Good stuff. And Warhorse says, good luck selling that stat to the families of those killed. Good point. Obviously, every loss in peacetime and training and war reaches a lot of folks. And this isn't an abstract for me. And anybody who's been in and around the military understands what Warhorse 500 is saying there. Okay, Aaron J., thanks. This is good gouge. PBS posted this data last year. V-22 Class A mishap rate was 3.6, according to Marines, 10-year average of 100,000 hours of flight time. Okay, so that's obviously not as bad as the CV-22. And some of that is the nature of the ops that they do. Right? AFSOC flies their airplanes at night, down low, into hostile areas. The Marines do that by exception. And the V-22 particularly hasn't really ever done air assault into a hot LZ. You know, they've been shot at some in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it, let's just say it was a semi-permissive environment. Uh, so the most dangerous flight ops that Marines do are around the boat. And to that point, to that point, here's a, a footage of a Marine mishap aboard an amphib. So not sure exactly what happened, but it looked like, looks like um, there was a, a thrust asymmetry here, right, in the end game, right? So the airplane rolls left, pretty hairy. So my point is the most dangerous flight ops that the Navy and Marine Corps do currently is around the, the at-sea environment, so amphibs, aircraft carriers. So getting on and off a deck uh, is, is inherently dangerous. Not sure if the CODs are going to fly at night. They were banned from flying at night as a function of mishaps that happened decades ago. Um, so I don't know if they've modified that. If anybody knows, let me know. Um, so thank you for that stat, Aaron. Good stuff. So JB Automotive and Marine says, my dad has thousands of hours as a loadmaster on the C2 running cod. He hates to think that the Osprey will replace the Greyhound. It's a unit of a plane. I'm not sure what that means, but thank you, dad, for his service. Great stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've actually, I'm old enough to have ridden in the back of a C1 and done a deck run 
off of the flight deck of the Kennedy, which CV-67 back in, when was that? 86, um, which is pretty sporty. But I've had a, a number of C-2 flights um, and may be flying the C-2 again coming up. As I've teased out, uh, it looks like Hoser and I are going aboard Harry S. Truman in the April time frame, exact date TBD. Um, we've also been invited aboard Lincoln on the West Coast, Air Wing of the Future, F-35s out there, so more to follow on that. But to get to Harry S. Tr or yeah, to get to Harry S. Truman, the East Coast, and I had this conversation with Emma Verissimo aboard Ford, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was down there. Um, the East Coast doesn't have CMV 22s yet. They will get them in time a few years from now. But right now they're using the, the Greyhound. So in order for Hoser and I to get to Harry S. Truman at sea, we're going to have to jump aboard a Greyhound. In fact, we're going to profile a Greyhound squadron for an episode, you know, at the same time that we, we get aboard and, and go out to the ships. That That's awesome. Um, it's a safe airplane, and I'm quite comfortable, uh, you know, trapping, cat shots, everything we got to do to get out to the boat. Let's see. Let's do a couple more questions here. Again, thanks to everybody for showing up here early on uh, a Thursday morning. Again, I thought this warranted uh, a discussion immediately because um, if I do the post-production, this wouldn't come out till tomorrow. And by that time, uh, it's not quite breaking news. So ECAD says, new airplanes are always old before they're ready for service. That's, that's true at, at some level. But there's old and then there's like obsolescent old. And we've got to combat the obsolescent old. Aircraft carriers are old when they're, by the time they're ready for service. You know, newest aircraft carrier Ford just went aboard. You know, it, it, it looks like an aircraft carrier that's been around for a while. I mean, it's in great shape, but still, you know, by the time it's constructed and you do all the sea trials and so forth and so on. When it goes on its first deployment, it's been a few years. Scott Pioso says, love your enemy. Yes, I'm at an FRS squadron. That's how many pilots have been maintaining some proficiency. That's how my pilots have been maintaining some proficiency. Um, I guess that means they're flying at the C2 rag. Is that what you mean, Scott? Or are we talking about V-22 pilots? Okay, so are we saying that the V-22 pilots are flying at the RAG and that's how they've been maintaining proficiency? So uh, if you could provide a little more detail there, Scott, that would be awesome. If what you mean is fleet V-22 pilots are coming to the, and I guess you're talking about MV-22 pilots are going to the RAG, which is at New River, um, then that makes sense to me. So Edson Gould says, I saw the prototype XV-20, XV-15 fly at Tustin in 1982, right? So belay my last. It's not 84, it's 82. Yeah, that's old. And I'm sure that was Tom McDonald, who's been Boeing's test pilot for years and years. Great human being who I got to work with at V-22. All right, a couple more here. So thanks for the super chat, Lane Hewitt, C27, comparable C2 size with bigger capacity. Um, so remind me, Lane, is that is that a, a commercial transport plane that could be navalized? Is that what you're saying? I think the, the plan was um, to just, you know, upgrade the, the airframe, Northrop Grumman airframe of the C2, make it into a C2 bravo or charlie jeff this will be the last one um jeff r says according to task and purpose i love those guys the class a mishap rate for the navy marine corps v-22 is between 2013 and 2023 is 3.16 per 100,000 hours c20 at a rate of 10.3 i think it means c2 do you mean c2 what's the c20 um and the fa and the F-18C had an 8.3. Wow. 
Okay, so uh, then relatively safe airplane based on those stats. Again, I worked at the Naval Safety Center for two years in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and those are high numbers. But the nature of ops matters. And if you're talking about under fire, at war, you know, then that's a different different ball game. All right, everybody. Uh, we'll call it right about an hour. Thanks. Pretty big crowd showing up on a Thursday. Um, appreciate your, your support. Appreciate the good discussion and questions. These are obviously much better when we have folks who are savvy in the chat. As soon as I end this live stream, it'll be a regular episode. So you can check it out if you miss some details or whatever else. And we'll keep our eyes on the situation here. If any greater explanations, more granular, more fidelity explanations emerge, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put them out. Um, as always, we're keeping our eyes on what's happening in the war. Um, like I said, uh, we have indications that what cut the cables was the, the, the ship hitting the bottom um, and, and not the Houthis doing SEAL team sabotage. However, you know, it's not a huge leap in logic to say, well, the Houthis are who caused it ultimately, right? And there's other things going on around Gaza with relief efforts, as you may have seen if you watched the State of the Union address last night. The president announced that we're putting a land bridge to do humanitarian support. That's going to be interesting how that plays out with the IDF and so forth and so on. And there are some, I've seen, credible critics who say, you know, in the, in the, as a siege is going on, if you supply humanitarian assistance, all that does is extend the siege. So we'll see what history has to say about that. You can look at you know Stalingrad and, and, and Leningrad and places like that, historical sieges, and see if that's in fact true. But we'll be take we'll be doing an episode about that very soon. So as always, if you're not a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything, including heads ups that live streams are happening with very little notice. And if you'd like to join Himmelganger and some other folks who are in this chat as a patron, and I love my patrons and, and they have access to, to special benefits, including our Zoom happy hours we do every Friday, then go to patreon.com slash Ward Carroll and, and sign up for whatever amount you feel like, like giving. It's not really about money. It's about uh, having a, a very intimate chat and, and a greater detailed chat. Also, don't forget Moochapalooza in Annapolis on July 13th. Save the date. It's a gathering of patrons, subscribers, and general supporters. Danger Boy, my band, will be playing. I'll be breaking out the SG and the Les Paul and the Junior. Not sure if I'm going to use the Marshall head or my new Mesa cabinet or Mesa head, which I love, by the way. But be some rock and roll, be some festival. It's always a good time. This will be our third annual one. So... Join us, details to follow in the community tab. So again, be a subscriber and you won't miss any of these things. And as always, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks.